Hello and welcome viewers. You're watching our continued coverage of the union budget. He suggested measures that it's India emerging from the once in a century COVID crisis with strong macroeconomic fundamentals as the former CEA. Today he speaks to us as the Executive Director India at the International Monetary Fund. Dr. K. V. Subramanian, welcome to Sunset TV and thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Kriti. Oh, well, the IMF says that India remains a bright spot. Do you think the budget presented today is far-sighted and balanced and will ensure that India continues to be a shining star of the world economy? Uh, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I would first commend the government for um, having resisted the temptation to be populist. Um, you know, in similar times, um, this being the last you know, full budget before the elections, um, you know, there has been a temptation to be extremely populist. Um, I think that temptation has been resisted. Instead, you know, the focus on continued focus on growth enhancing, uh, you know, uh, a policy has been uh, has been uh, focused on. So I think, uh, you know, that's the, that to me is the big picture that I take away uh, in terms of the specifics. I would particularly point out the uh, significant outlay for you know public capital expenditures. Um, you know, uh, together, you know, with the incentives that have been given to states um, with these fifty-year loans, which have to be spent now either this year or you know or the coming year. Uh, about 13.7 lakh crores, which is actually four and a half percent of GDP. That's a mammoth sum. Um, you know, I think by far the largest, both in rupees and in uh, you know, and as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and I think it is it is good policy because already the benefits from this policy are are being seen. Uh, you just mentioned how India is a bright spot. It is because of this emphasis on the supply side that India emerged out of COVID as a positive outlier, you know, compared to the rest of the global economy, both on growth and on inflation. And I think, uh, you know, even employment, if you look at, I was looking at the data, the PLFS data shows that, you know, even during the uh, COVID period, if you compare 2018-19 vis-a-vis 2021, uh, 66 lakh jo jobs have been created more in the formal sector. So clearly this policy is working. And I think the continuation of that is something that is very good. Second aspect that I would focus on is the financial sector. Yeah. This was another key you know, aspect of emphasis, you know, starting from the 2021-22 budget, the, the post-COVID budget. Uh, and this year, again, you know, that has been really emphasized on one of the key uh, successes of the, you know, uh, COVID economic policy was the credit guarantee scheme for MSMEs. Outlay for that uh, guarantee money of 9,000 crores has been provided, which should lead to, you know, 2 lakh crores of additional credit, credit because this is only money that the government has to pay for the first loss, you know, on these loans. So I think, uh, you know, uh, in, an, in an environment where already credit to MSMEs this year has been increasing at 35%, this is economic survey data that I just observed. Uh, I think the momentum to this will significantly increase. Finally, as part of financial sector that I would actually mention, uh, the, the 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 creation of the you know national financial information registry. To me, I think that's a very fundamental step. Uh, you would recall, Kriti, that uh, in the 2019-20 economic survey chapter on golden jubilee of bank nationalization, we had suggested this idea, you know, through the you know, what we had called it at that time, the public sector banking network. In spirit, uh, this idea is actually similar. It will reduce the information asymmetry, you know, for borrowers and thereby enhance credit creation and, and also accelerate, uh, you know, uh, 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 accelerate growth uh, through credit creation. So overall, I think by resisting the temptation to be populist and, and just focusing on the, you know, growth measures, uh, the budget has done a very good job. And I actually, I'm, you know, really happy about it. Well, that sounds inspiring and that's a broad picture, but I'll come to the specifics. There are serious challenges around. You talked about uh, employment, but there are global layoffs as well. So has the budget laid down concrete policies to address the issues of unemployment, inflation, and the slowdown in economic growth, that's something uh, that even the IMF also pointed out. So I think, uh, you know, uh, on employment, I must point out that uh, the actual situation is, you know, is better than, uh, you know, what a lot of commentators, you know, deem it to be. Uh, it is because of the uh, use of the unreliable, noisy CMI data by a lot of the commentators. If we go by the official 
PLFS data, which is put out by the uh, National you know, Sample and Survey uh, Organization, NSSO. I think clearly, uh, you know, both in terms of pre-COVID and you know, post-COVID, clearly there's been significant improvement. If you look at the three critical measures that I use to uh, you know, judge the quantity of employment, which is your worker population ratio, the, uh, you know, the, the, the labor force participation ratio, which is LFPR, and the unemployment rate, on all these three measures, you know, the uh, um, economy has clearly recovered past COVID. Um, even in terms of the actual number of, you know, um, employees, if you look at the salaried uh, or the regular wage wage wage, wage employees also increased significantly, you know, post-COVID. Uh, so overall, I think the employment situation is far better than a lot of commentators who actually look at the unreliable CMI data tend to believe. Um, but that said, I think the, uh, you know, this is an area we, where we cannot rest at all. I think, you know, if there is one area, I've mentioned to the, this to you in my earlier interactions with you, Kriti, as well, if there is one area that India must continue focusing on, it is jobs, jobs, and jobs. Um, and I think, in that context, the significant emphasis on public capex will be very critical That's because, um, you know, if you think about just the brass tacks, um, you know, construction sector activity really picks up when you have, you know, public capex and, and that creates jobs for the urban poor. Also through ancillary sectors like cement, steel, you know, many of the other sectors that benefit from, you know, from public capex. I must mention that even private capex the crowding in seems to be happening. Uh, you know, if you look at the the economic survey and uh, chapter nine talks about how from April to December of this year, of, of 2022, uh, the new uh, investment in, in manufacturing is thrice that of the financial year 2020 over the same period. So that is clearly suggesting the crowding in. Uh, you would have also noticed that overall, the uh, you know economic vision that was outlaid, uh, you know that was laid out, you know in in in, in previous economic surveys through the virtuous cycle, yes. uh, through the multiplier effects of of you know of of uh, uh, public spending and the crowding in of private investment, the Honorable Finance Minister mentioned all of these. So I think what I really uh, uh, um, commend is the consistency of the economic vision that has been pursued despite the temptation to possibly have been you know, uh, populist. Well, I'll agree with you on that one, but you'll have to agree with me that we are living in an uncertain era. There are concerns yeah. about another onslaught of the pandemic. There's Ukraine-Russia war. Look at the geopolitical situation. Will this budget provide cushion against these global headwinds? I think that's a very good question, Priti. Um, if we look at the overall, uh, you know, global situation, clearly there is a chance of, you know, of a recession in Europe. Uh, Germany has already, uh, you know, this Q Q4, there's a decline of, of 0.2%. So that's that's essentially a recession. Uh, overall, the global economy, I think, might grow, you know, might stretch to grow at 1% to 1.5%. So clearly, the, uh, you know, the global uh, situation is something that is, you know, an aspect of worry. I will uh, definitely uh, mention that. That said, I think the impact of, of the global economy on the Indian economy, in my opinion, will be limited. If you look at it, you know, examine this more rigorously. If you take the GDP identity, which is, you know, GDP is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, um, you know, 60% of GDP is consumption and that is domestic. That is not getting impacted. And I think if anything, the tax breaks will actually accelerate that. Uh, investment, as I just mentioned, public capex has been focused on and private capex seems to be picking up. So I think, you know, the only component of investment that may get impacted because of the global factor Factors would be the foreign direct investment. I think, uh, you know, it may be a little bit impacted, but not very much because India continues to be a very attractive destination for, you know, foreign direct investment. Uh that, that we have government spending, as I said, already actually is good uh, while, you know, continuing the fiscal consolidation path. Uh, the last item, which is exports, I think might yes. be far more impacted yes. than, than any of these other items. Um, and I think that is already being seen. Uh, so overall, I would say the impact of these glo the global economy on Indian growth might be between, you know, 50 to 60 basis points, about half a percentage point on average, therefore. Um, and that is why I think the... If if you look at the numbers, and I uh, went through the numbers carefully, the revenue, uh, you know, uh, projection is it's only increasing by 10.5%. Um, you know, the economic survey made a projection of nominal growth of 11%. Right. The budget is, seems to be using 10.5% as a growth rate. And, you know, tax uh, buoyancy has been assumed to be one. 
uh, you know, in the last couple of years, tax buoyancy has been 1.2. So I think the revenue projections should definitely be, be achievable because it's an underestimate. Plus the, you know, if you look at the expenditure side, expenditure has, has grown only at seven and a half percent. Of that, if we take the major contribution, which comes from the central government schemes, the, you know, centrally sponsored schemes and other central government, you know, expenditure, you know, on, on, on schemes, uh, which accounts for 70, 72% of overall expenditure that has grown at, at eight odd percent. Uh, so there's been clear expenditure rationalization because of which I think the fiscal consolidation part is a very solid one, which it should be achievable. So I would therefore summarize by saying that while there is global uncertainty, I think the budget has actually conditioned for it, has taken into account, and therefore I do not see you know uh, any of the projections going awry because of the global factors. But I'll come back to exports. Do you think that more needs to be done for improving export link growths? I, I think once again a very good question. Um, so I I think if you if you look at the uh, PLI scheme, the increase in employment, you know, in the larger MSME. So uh, yesterday the economic survey showed that employment in you know, firms that have more than 100 employees has increased. This is using the annual survey of industries data. So I think that is good news. Why? Because, you know, when we look at exports, the reason why, uh, you know, exports have not grown as as well, you know, in India is because of the lack of competitiveness. Um, and, and that itself stems from, you know, things like labor costs, you know, logistics costs, you know, cost of capital um, and, and, you know, economies of scale. And, and I think if you look at the budget this year, each of these has been focused on, you know, the, uh, the public capex includes significant outlays for railways, which actually will account for, you know, will reduce sort of logistics costs. Uh, the power sector, you know, of the th of the three and a half percent fiscal deficit of states that is allowed, half a percent is conditioned on power sector reforms. I think that is very, very useful. I already mentioned about the economies of scale. And I also spoke about the MSME credit growth um, and the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, national, you know, uh, financial information registry, right. all of which should help on the capital side. So I think while there is deceleration in exports because of the global factors, I think steps have been taken to actually arrest that and, and thereby limit the damage to exports. All right, uh, moving on and let's talk about startups. Now, the economic survey has called for simpler tax rules and processes to help Indian-owned startups in reverse flipping or shifting their base back to India. What could be the roadmap ahead, sir? So I think if you look at the budget, um, and emphasize significantly, um, uh, I, I um, have not seen, you know, other measures for the other areas. Overall, I think startup creation and other sectors have have, have, have preceded uh, this this year's budget. But uh, the focus on agriculture is welcome because this is one area where you know innovation needs to happen significantly. Uh, and and I think the emphasis on agriculture, you know, uh, startups through the fund that the uh, honourable finance minister spoke about, I think is a is a is a very good thing. At the same time. She also talked about the agri stack. You know, she didn't use that term, but I'm actually, you know, using that term for the, you know, digital infrastructure in agriculture, which can actually help, you know, crop patterns and overall, you know, crop sowing actually estimate so that farmers can know how much to sow and in what crop. I think that agri stack would be a very important measure, you know, in, in, a, in some ways a fundamental, you know, digital infrastructure for agriculture. So when you put the two together, I think agriculture startups can really use the agri stack to really uh, you know come up with innovations so i would see therefore innovation and startups primarily in the agriculture sector as a result of this year's budget of course measures that have been taken in previous years should foster continue to foster the uh, startup ecosystem um, i i don't think you know uh, uh, you know, there are spe specific measures in terms of, you know, uh, reducing compliance for startups. Uh, that's not something that we've seen. But at the same time, overall reduction in compliance burden, burden and, you know, some of the decriminalization, I think, should help startups as well. Because, you know, typically what happens is compliance, you know, the same amount of compliance bites startups and smaller firms far more than larger firms. So I think that should that's that should help um, overall. But I think uh, just to sum summarize, therefore, the action that we should see on startups, you know, I, I would expect it in the agriculture sector. All right. And the digital push, your thoughts on its uh, multiplier impact on Indian economy? 
I think uh, that has been the India story. You know, Kriti, when I, uh, you know, uh, when discussions on India happen here in the IMF board, one of the first things that is mentioned by, you know, all the directors, you know, executive directors and the MD is basically the digital economy. Um, so I think, you know, there, um, uh, there's there's one, one, one area which has not gotten as much, you know, attention, I think, in the budget, which is the PM Vikas scheme for artisans. Yeah. Uh, this is also, right. you know, a very important, you know, uh, uh, area because a lot of the artisans tend to be, you know, in the informal sector, typically, they, you know, are, are therefore not very productive. Uh, but by ensuring market access and access to credit um, and, you know, uh, um, some of the so creation of a Kariga stack, again, yeah. a term that I'm using to capture the, uh, you know, the the, the uh, ideas that has been put out in the, bu in the budget, I think, uh, you know, clearly will help, uh, you know, Karigas as well. So the digitization on that part, I think, is a very good news. A apart from that, also, uh, there were measures to enhance some of the presence of UPI, you know, in, in other countries countries. So it not only, you know, uh, has India now really, uh, you know, sort of built up its digital infrastructure, but is also now ready to share this expertise with other countries, which will also be very useful, because, you know, it'll enhance, you know, um, some of the, uh, uh, some of the other, you know, Indo Indians in other countries actually spending on India, right. thereby remittance should also actually accelerate. Absolutely. And before we let you go, your closing thoughts or closing remarks on budget and Amrit Kal. So I think this budget is for the Amrit Kal. That's the way I would connect it. Um, you know, by resisting the temptation to be populist, um, the budget has clearly uh, laid out the roadmap for Amrit Kal. Um, I, the uh, emphasis on, you know, public capex, financial sector and overall ease of doing business. These are part of the economic vision that this government has laid out for Amrit Kal. And I think this budget is a significant impetus to achieving the, the, those goals under Amrit Kal. All right, sir. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us. My pleasure, Kriti. Well, viewers, that's all we had for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Sunset TV. Goodbye for now from my side.